Hi friends, my name is E, and today we're going to continue working with Gleam, but this time do kind of like a getting started video. So if you're interested in kind of Gleam programming uh, and wanted to kind of jump into it, this video is for you and it will kind of explain how to get set up, what the folder structure looks like, what the files are doing, and various commands you can be running to uh, work with your new Gleam project. Uh, if you go to the Gleam website, gleam.run, there is this getting started page. And if we go there, there's going to be lots of information on how to install Gleam and all of its dependencies on various um, uh, architectures and operating systems and such. I'm on a OS X here, so that's where I'll be kind of basing my stuff. But if you need to install on a separate system, this getting started page is the page for you. Uh, and everything I'm going to be covering in this video is also in this getting started uh, workflow. But, you know, this is more for those visual learners out there that want, want more of a, a video overview. So what we're going to do is I'm going to switch over to my terminal here. And the first thing you're going to want to do is install Gleam. And so on OS X, the easiest way to do this is with Homebrew. So I can do brew install Gleam. And then we also need rebar 3. Um, I should note this recording is in April 9th. And some of this may have changed. If you're watching this in the far future, you may not need to uh, do rebar on the side here, but right now, this is what you're going to need to do to install all of Gleam and the dependencies it requires. Now, I've already installed this, so Brew should hopefully just uh, update itself and then say, yep, it's already up to date uh, with the latest versions. But for you, this would actually do the, all the installation and all that stuff. OK, so once we have Gleam installed, you should actually have a Gleam binary. Oops, that ignore that. Uh, so if I do which Gleam, we can see Homebrew's properly installed it. And if I do Gleam capital V, that's what version I'm running. Uh, actually, that's not what version I'm running. That I'm actually on 20. Uh, ignore the 21. A lot of stuff for, to ignore here. Um, so let's say we want to start a new Gleam project. That would be Gleam new, and we're going to create a calculator. So if we do that, we can see that uh, we will have this new calculator, and this generated super duper fast. And so we're just going to follow the instructions here and CD in. And now we can immediately run Gleam test. And what this is going to do is this is going to uh, both resolve all the required versions and then download any packages that are required, compile everything, and then finally run the test. And you can see it did all of that way faster than I was able to explain it. Uh, it took about two seconds to do everything. Um, so let's kind of take a look at our new folder structure. So here you can see that we have a build folder, which is where all of our built assets were put into, a gleam.toml file, and this is what kind of describes our project and our dependencies, a manifest uh, toml file, and this is kind of like a lock file that you may have used in Ruby or JavaScript or probably Python, uh, a quick readme, all of our, where our source code goes and where our test code goes. So let's open up Vim. And let's take a look at that gleam.toml file. So you can see inside this toml file, we've described the name of our package or project. Uh, this is calculator. It's given us an initial version of 0 0.10. And then you can also see that it's also added a couple of dependencies for us. So we have the gleam standard library uh, as one dependency. So one of the interesting things about gleam is the standard library is actually a dependency or a separate package outside of the programming language itself. And this is nice because that means we can update the standard library uh, without having to update our language and vice versa. And then finally, we also have a quick little test runner called Glee unit. Um, and that's also part of our dev dependencies. So if you wanted to add a new dependency, you could add it manually here, or you could do it via the Gleam add command. And the rest is some metadata if you wanted to publish this uh, for others to use. Um, if we look at the manifest file, you can see that um, this is basically just has exactly what it's downloaded uh, with some checksums and such like that. Uh, you will probably never need to manually touch this file. Uh, and in fact, it says you don't need to edit this file right here. Cool. So let's take a look at our test and source code. So this is what is uh, just generated for us by, uh, by default. So if we jump inside here, we'll see that we have a very, very simple uh, entry point uh, where all we're doing is we're exporting this main function. 
and I'll talk about that in just a bit. And all that we're doing when we do main is uh, print line from the Gleam IO, and this is coming from the standard library. And if we look at our test file, uh, this is importing Glee unit, and Glee unit should. Uh, it is also exporting a main function, but here it's just kind of initializing Glee unit. And then finally, here's a little test example, and this is the test that ran when we ran Gleam test. So you can see that did that, and if we change this to equal to, and we ran it again, hey, there we go. So we got expected to, got one. So we know that this is actually running the test that we expect. So uh, let me kind of walk through maybe some other commands you may want to run. So we already saw Gleam test is a very nice command to make sure all your tests are passing. You can also run Gleam run. And what that's going to do is that that's actually going to run the main function of what's the entry point. So in your, your main source file here, it's going to find this main function. And when I run Gleam run, that's going to run this. So this is where you could like boot up a server or you know anything like that. Um, and then finally, there's also Gleam build. So this is implicitly being run whenever you run the test because it needs to build before we can test. Uh, but this is also you know just if you want to build uh, your stuff. And what that's going to do is that's going to uh, generate this build folder for us here. So before we go forward, I just want to also talk about the targets that you can build towards. In Gleam, the default target is Erlang. So when we run Gleam build, this is going to, uh, or Gleam test even, this is actually going to generate some Erlang code, and then that's what's actually going to be run to run the tests or you know build all the stuff. But Gleam also targets JavaScript. And if we wanted to build JavaScript, all we really need to do is add this target flag and say, hey, please target JavaScript. And if we run that, and if we look inside this dev folder, we'll now see that we have both an Erlang folder and a JavaScript folder. And this is where the built versions of both of those. What's also interesting is we can run our tests via JavaScript. So uh, if we go back to our Gleam test, and we also add this target equals JavaScript, you can see uh, we actually ran the test, and it has slightly different output. One test, zero failures, while this one had finished in 0 0.000 seconds. So these are actually being run by two separate test runners. Um, one is the JavaScript test runner, and one is the Erlang test runner. Um, and if you're trying to create a package that can be used in uh, both a JavaScript context as well as an Erlang uh, context, this is a great way to make sure that your code works in both runtimes. Um, if we want to look at the built assets, we can actually look at, if we look at JavaScript, we can open up the calculator project. Um, inside build is just going to be some uh, Gleam module folders uh, or, or uh, files here. You can kind of ignore these. This is just some metadata that Gleam uses to know about its built assets. But this disk folder actually contains our MJS files. So if we take a look at the calculator test, we can see that uh, this looks very, very similar to the Gleam code, where we're importing Gleam unit, we're importing should. We have this kind of like main function that initializes Gleam unit. And then finally, we have our little test test, uh, which initializes a pipe to one and then says should equal pipe one. Pretty simple. Um, and we could do the same with Erlang. Uh, but let's actually write some Gleam code. So let's close all this down, jump back into here. And um, this is a calculator package, so we might as well add some calculation functions. So let's do some test-driven development. Let's get rid of this uh, test test. And let's write a new test. Let's call this add. And then all tests inside your tests have to end with the word test. Does that make sense? Mm, let's try that again. All of your functions, your test functions, need to end with this underscore test word for Gleam to know that this is actually a function that is running a test. So we're going to call this add test. And we're going to say um, uh, c dot add five and one should equal six. And what is that C? So uh, where did that C come from? Well, I haven't written it yet. So let's import. And then when you write an import inside your tests, it's going to match the exact same structure of what's in your source folder. So if we name this file calculator, that's what we're going to name our import. 
And then I'm just going to alias it using the as keyword as C, just so I don't have to write the word calculator each time. And now if we did that and we run our tests, and let's just do the Erlang test runner. Um, and it's saying, hey, you forgot the function keyword. And I'm like, you're totally right. I did forget that. And now it's complaining like, hey, uh, unknown modular, modular, mod, wow, I'm really, I'm really struggling here. Unknown module field. And what that means is this module, the calculator module, doesn't actually export a add field. And it's saying, did you mean main? Because that's the only field that's currently uh, being exported. So if we switch back to calculator, we can make that pass by just saying uh, test. And we won't fill it in just yet. Now, there is a thing. If you have an empty function like this and you run, you're going to get an, a syntax error. Uh, there is no such thing as an empty function in Gleam, at least not yet. Um, so what you can do if you want to just stub out a function is you can just use the to-do keyword. And this just means, hey, I, I haven't done anything yet. I'll figure this out eventually. Just put a to-do here. Um, so it's still saying I don't have an add field. Oh, that's because I called this test. <laughs> there we go. Cool. And now we are saying, hey, I expected zero arguments, got two. So let's just keep test running. Uh, so let's add our two arguments, x and y. And now we're saying, OK, uh, this function, I got this. This function has not been implemented. Uh, error coming back at me, which is coming from this to do. So uh, now let's actually implement this. Let's just say x plus y. And now we're passing. And what you'll notice is I didn't actually need to type the um, what this is a result of. I didn't have actually have to write this part. Gleam is pretty smart, um, and it will make it so that you don't have to write uh, your types very often. It will just do a lot of type inference. So it can know, well, if these two, if both entry points here are int integers, and I'm just adding them, well, then the output is automatically an integer as well. No need to write this unless you want to do it just to make it easier for your fellow developer just to quickly scan and understand the signature of a function. So that works. And we can also make sure it works in JavaScript. It also works in JavaScript. Uh, we can add just quickly a multiply function. And that's as simple as that. And then if we run back to our tests, we can copy this and say multiply test. And we can say 5 times 5 multiply, multiply. And we should see this fail. Uh, I did mul, well, I'm forgetting a T, but you know what? This is a quick video. doesn't matter. We'll keep it misspelled. And we're saying, hey, 25 should equal 6, which is exactly what we expected to happen there. And so if we fix this to actually point to the right stuff, there we go. We are all passing now. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it. That is your extremely quick introduction to Gleam. Uh, hopefully this is enough to get people kind of started um, and is a much shorter video for me, uh, which is probably something that you all are looking forward to. Uh, I will be coming up with more Gleam videos soon, uh, so watch this channel. Uh, if there's something you'd particularly want me to cover, please leave a comment. Um, and yeah, uh, I'll keep plugging Gleam. I'll keep plugging our Discord. So uh, if you want to join, just click the Community tab, go down to Discord, and then boom, you can join the Gleam programming community here um, and answer any or ask any questions you want. Yeah, thanks for watching. Uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.